Father, we thank you for today. And, and as we are in the December time of the year, we're just uh, glad that we can be here together and to encourage one another and to sing songs of praise to you and to uplift your name. As people are joining us online, I pray that they would know that uh, you are there and that uh, you just want to serve you. As we go on through today, I pray that this service will uh, bring that honor and glory to you, be it in the sermon or the offering or the communion time or the singing, that it's for you that we do this. And as your son came as a baby, we celebrate that now. And throughout the season, we know later on, there'll be what we get real reason that he's here. For now, the joy that we have of him coming is just what we look for. Thank you for each person here. Thank you for those joining us online and that together we can serve you. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen. If you would rather have it on a piece of paper, put in the offering, then we do take requests of prayer and praises that way also.
Good morning, everybody. Sometimes we sheep tend to forget we don't have the lead role in a Christmas story, all right? But when we get it right, it becomes clear, if you want to check out the title for the sermon today, God takes the lead, but we are to follow. Would you pray with me, please? Father, speak to us through this familiar story that is so dear. Speak to us, not just what you have done for us, as glorious as that is, but also the call you've given for us as well. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. God takes the lead, but we are to follow. If you would open up your worship folders, you got a sermon outline. It'll help you out today. There's a couple blanks to fill in. As you do, you'll see that our Christmas series is named In the Fullness of Time, and we're drawing that theme from Galatians 4, verses 4 to 5, where it says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, Born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. If I were to ask you this question, if I were to ask you to sum up the events of the first Christmas in just one word, what would you say? Love, joy, peace, wonder? Miracle, last year I used the word grace. Let me give you this morning a word you might not have been expecting, a word that brings together many of the elements of the Christmas story. That word is obedience. We're talking about the obedience of Christmas as seen through, if you're looking at your outlines, the obedience. The obedience of Christ. Listen to Galatians 4, 4 and following again. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive the full right of sons. The story of Christmas is the story of a father sending a son. And it's the story of the Son of God who obeyed his heavenly Father. Christmas is the story of a son going away from home. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. God sent his Son And the son obeyed. J.I. Packer, who probably most famously is known for writing the book Knowing God, he also wrote this. God became a man. The divine son became a Jew. The Almighty appeared on earth as a helpless human baby, unable to do more than lie and stare and wiggle and make noises, needing to be fed and changed and taught to talk like any other child. And there was no illusion or deception in this. The babyhood, I've never heard it quite put that way, but the babyhood of the Son of God was a reality. And the more you think about it, the more staggering it gets. Nothing in fiction is so fantastic as is the truth of the incarnation. Philippians 2, 6, Christ, being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus, the Son of God, was obedient to his heavenly Father. And as we get further into the yearly calendar, and Easter comes early this year, we're familiar with thinking about the sacrifice of Calvary or the sacrifice of the cross. But today we're not talking about the sacrifice of Calvary, but the sacrifice of Bethlehem. The message translates Philippians 2 this way. Think of yourselves the way that Christ Jesus thought of himself. 
He had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status no matter what. Not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave, became human. Having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life and then died a selfless, obedient death and the worst kind of death at that, a crucifixion. God sent his son and his son obeyed the obedience of Christmas. The poet John Donne wrote, the whole life of Christ was a continual passion. Others die martyrs, but Christ was born a martyr. He found a Golgotha, where he was crucified, even in Bethlehem, where he was born. For to his tenderness then, the straws were almost as sharp as the thorns after, and the major as as uneasy at first as his cross at last. His birth and his death were but one continual act And his Christmas Day and his Good Friday are but the evening and morning of one and the same day. Hebrews 5, 7. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud, loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Charles Swindoll wrote, To be like Christ, that is our goal, plain and simple. It sounds like a peaceful, relaxing, easy objective, but stop and think. He learned obedience by the things he suffered. So must we. It is neither easy nor quick nor natural. It is impossible in the flesh, slow in coming and supernatural in scope. Only Christ can accomplish it within us. But when we talk about the obedience of Christmas, we're talking about not only Christ's obedience, but also the obedience of Mary. Do you remember these words the angel Gabriel spoke to Mary in Luke chapter 1, verses 31 and following? You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. The kingdom will never end. And Mary asked the angel, how will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Have you ever thought about this? When the the angel appeared to Mary and explained God's amazing plan of salvation, Mary could have just said, no, 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 I, I, I didn't sign up for this. But Mary trusted God, and she chose to obey God. On your screen is a great quote that the, the great preacher Charles Spurgeon once wrote, faith and obedience are bound up in the same bundle. He that obeys God trusts God, and he that trusts God obeys God. It's going to cause us to swallow every once in a while, all right? I'm going to read it again. Faith and obedience are bound up in the same bundle. He that obeys God trusts God, and he that trusts God obeys God. That's a great statement. How did Mary respond to Gabriel? Luke 138, I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. And Mary's obedience, as we look, wasn't this grudging, reluctant obedience, you know, oh, if I have to, but a joyful, willing obedience. 
A little bit further, same chapter, Luke 1, beginning with verse 46. Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. We're not going to get into it today, but this blessing of God caused uh, much consternation. Is that an easy way of putting it for Mary, Joseph, her family? The obedience of Christmas. Mary was prepared to go along and play her part in God's plan as so should we be. Number three on your outline, and that brings us to the obedience of Joseph. Got your Bibles? Time to use it. Jump to Matthew chapter 1. We're going to begin reading with verse 18, please. Matthew 1, verse 18. I'll wait for you to get there. Matthew 1, 18. When you got it, look up and smile. Good morning to you too. Matthew 1, 18, this is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had a mind to divorce her quietly. We know by reading scripture law, she was subject to stoning. But after he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and she will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Verse 24, when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and he took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son and he gave him the name Jesus. The obedience of Christmas. Joseph stood by his fiance. Joseph didn't abandon Mary, but he stuck with her. And here's a question for you. How much do you think Joseph understood what was happening here? Do you ever wonder how you would have reacted? Perhaps you're thankful you weren't in uh, Joseph's sandals, so to speak, you know. But there's a very real sense in which we do share his shoes. Joseph was challenged to believe that God had done this. So are we. Joseph was challenged to receive and welcome Jesus the Savior. So are we. Joseph was challenged to devote the rest of his life to Jesus. So are we. So are we, are you, willing or not? Recognize that decision is always a costly one. Joseph's experience illustrates a broader biblical principle. Welcoming Christ into your life means that you share in what happened to Jesus. Jesus himself taught this, John 15, 19. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. The Apostle Paul experienced this firsthand, talks about it multiple times. And there's definitely another cost involved. The, the lead in our story changes. You know, as you read through the Christmas narrative, at first, at first sight, you know, as, as we read the first two chapters of Matthew, it looks as though where Joseph goes, Jesus goes, but as we read it, we soon discover it's really the other way around, isn't it? Where Jesus goes, 
Joseph also goes. If Jesus has to be a refugee in Egypt, so does Joseph. That wasn't in his plans. If Jesus has to be brought up in Nazareth to Nazareth, Joseph must go. So what we see in Joseph's life is a striking illustration of a very real truth. The Christ we receive by faith is also the Christ who shapes our life of faith. And those who come to, dis- to believe in him discover, like Joseph and Mary and Peter and Paul, that life starts taking on, we've used this phrase before, a Jesus shape. Therefore, we see the application of 2 Corinthians 4.10 that we who live in Christ are, and I quote, always carrying around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. Paul said it this way in Galatians 2.20, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for. How how important is this? This is the way in which we are being transformed into his likeness. There's a there's a verse in that uh, hymn, "O Little Town of Bethlehem." We often don't sing this far down, but how silently, how silently, the wonderful gift is given. So God imparts to human hearts the blessing of his heaven. No ear may hear his coming, but in this world of sin, where meek souls will receive him, still the dear Christ enters in. We need to learn the kind of obedience which Mary and Joseph demonstrated as they played their vital parts in God's master plan of salvation. Because the truth is that we, like most Christians, are educated beyond our obedience. Can you hear that? What I'm saying is we know in our minds more truth than we put into action in our lives. Sometimes we think we need, we need more teaching, but in reality, the greatest need in most churches is not for most, more teaching, but for more obedience. Look at the screen. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, one act of obedience is better than a hundred sermons. I expected a chorus of amens at this point. Thank you for being kind, all right? Next one, Oswald Chambers. We... We learn more by five minutes of obedience than by 10 years of study. So what is the secret of Christ's obedience in Mary's and Joseph's? You got your, got your outline out? You got a blank here. Their obedience came from their relationship with God. They trusted God and so they Obeyed him. Remember, it's a bundle. Andrew Murray wrote, The secret of true obedience is the clear and close relationship to God. All our attempts after full obedience will be failures until we get access to his abiding fellowship. It is God's presence consciously abiding with us that keeps us from disobeying him. I must consciously include the Lord in every thought, activity, and conversation until the habit is established. Do you remember Paul's words from Galatians 2.20? I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in a body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. How about those of John the Baptist? John 3.30, New American Standard Bible. He must increase, but I must, anybody? Decrease. NIV has, he must become greater, I must become less. The lead in our story changes. The obedience of Christmas. 
Now, in 1 Corinthians 3, 9, Paul uses an interesting phrase. He says, for we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. He uses the same phrase again in 2 Corinthians 6, 1. As God's fellow workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. God's fellow workers. Paul saw himself as God's fellow worker. In the mystery of the incarnation, Mary and Joseph were God's fellow workers. In the church and world today, every one of us are God's fellow workers. And each one of us has our job to do and our part to play. The, the obedience of Christmas. Christmas is a story of God's saving acts in the mystery of the incarnation. It is indeed a story of love and joy and peace and wonder and miracles and most certainly grace. But Christmas is also the story of human obedience. By Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Joseph, her fiance, and even the obedience of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and and for the story to have its right ending, we must follow their examples. Do you remember Mary's words? I am the Lord's servant. May it happen to me as you have said. I was praying before church today. And I looked up on my whiteboard in my office and I saw a quote that I wrote, wrote down from, from our favorite missionary, Dale, that he gave us back in April in one of those missions moments. It's up on my whiteboard. You might remember it. We as a church or as individuals are most in harmony with God when we do what he came to do. He said, I came to do the will of the Father. For this story to have the right ending, we must have the, we got to follow their examples. I am the Lord's servant. May it happen to me as you have said. Would you pray with me, please? Lord Jesus, the challenge of receiving you rightly and living for you can be overwhelming at times, but we want to be yours. We, we want to trust you, to love you, to serve you. And we thank you that when we are yours, you make us more and more like yourself. Thank you for the blessing of Christmas. You are reaching out to us in Jesus. You coming to us. May you please find us responding by us following and obeying you. Taking our role as your fellow worker. In Jesus name I pray. We're going to stand, we're going to sing, we're going to invite our prayer partners to come forward. We're going to sing a song of praise, and this is indeed something to be praiseworthy. Just like Mary responded in praise with God's call upon her life, so should ours be. Would you join us as we sing? Yeah. 
As we come to this time of communion this morning, I'm thinking about one of my favorite themes um, during Christmas time, and that's thinking about um, darkness and light. And I was thinking about this passage in the first few verses of the Gospel of John, and it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Uh, this last week, I had to run by the church early in the morning um, before the sun was up, and it was really dark in here. All the lights were turned off, all the Christmas lights were off. Kind of an ominous feeling. Um, I had to run into the kitchen and grab something, and as I was coming back out, I noticed that coming through the sanctuary doors, there was a little bit of light shining, and what is that? Something's on. So I walked over here and I looked into the sanctuary and back here, this light behind the cross was just bright as can be. And directly below it was this manger, this crib where the baby is lying. And I just, it was just a beautiful image of the fact that when Christ came as a baby, um, there was a very specific and intentional mission to be accomplished, even at the beginning. Um, and it was the light and the life that he would provide ultimately through his death and through his resurrection. So as we take this bread and we take this juice that represents his blood, just be reminded of the obedience that Jesus partook in, doing the will of his Father so that we can have new life. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, thank you so much for accomplishing the mission that you set out to accomplish. Lord, you came to live amongst us we celebrate that life, and Lord, we're so grateful that you were obedient to give up your life so that we can experience reconciliation with the Father. Lord, thank you for all that you do. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.
get to come to a time um, where we get to consider all of the things that the Lord has given to us. And it was a very encouraging word this morning, and I would just encourage you and challenge you as well that um, through our obedience to the Lord that we would um, be obedient not only in the things that we do, the lives that we live, um, but in the ways that we give as well. We'll have an opportunity to give back um, just a small portion of what God has given to us. Would you pray with me? Uh, dear Heavenly Father, again, we just thank you for this morning, a chance for us to be together and to worship. And Lord, would the money that we give back to you be another, um, another example of our worship to you and our obedience to you? Lord, would we be willing to give, even if it's difficult? Would you push us to do so so that we can continue to be a part of what you are already at work doing? Thank you for all that you've given to us. And it's in Jesus' name. Inside, you got a couple inserts. The white one is for visitors on the one side. If you fill that out, take it to the table back there. The other side are for prayer concerns. We'd love to come pray alongside of you. The mustard-colored sheet is uh, one side is sermon outline that we used before. The other side, please look at, are some um, what we're going to call study questions. You can call it a devotional time. We have some small groups that go through this. I, um, it's designed for you as individuals to take some time to consider throughout the week what was brought from God's word today. When we start really holding up this, that trust and obedience are one bundle. He tells us clearly in John 15 that if you love me, you'll do what I say. Um, we can't separate the two. We can't say that we trust him and then not obey. It's difficult to work through at times. I'm hoping these questions help us to at least walk us that way so we can enter into dialogue with him, hear from him, be moved again by him, um, not just not just on Sunday. That's what it's there for. We'd love for you to use it. Inside, we've got some announcements. Christmas Eve, Sunday morning, and Christmas Eve services. Christmas Eve falls on Sunday this year. Uh, we're going to have our normal services at 9 and 1045. Uh, children will be in here. It'll be a family-type Sunday. Uh, later on that day, we're going to have one what we would normally call our Christmas Eve service at 4 o'clock. We want to make sure everybody has an opportunity to either attend in the morning or in the afternoon in preparation for Christmas Day. I hope you can join us. Um, backside, Angel Tree is back. I need you to hear me. We, we generally clear that tree off pretty quick. We didn't do so last week. Um, we've got a number of these gifts that come through Salvation Army to go back into our community still on a tree. We need to clear the tree today because the presents are due next week and you can, all the instructions are on here about where you can return them and how they should be unwrapped and all that other kind of thing. But this is the last week we have for doing this. So if you are able, would love for you to be able to try to use this as an opportunity to bless some others in our community. We don't have it in the worship folder, but this Wednesday we have uh, some special events coming up beginning at 445. 445. 445. We're going to leave from here and go caroling to a couple places. We'll 
bundle up in cars and follow each other and do that. When we get done with the caroling, we're going to come back here and there's going to be chili and I believe cinnamon rolls are on there and we get to visit and, and everything. Um, the kids would go with the parents to go caroling. If we come at 445, there's not child care while we go caroling. It's a family event. Come back, we'll eat. And then after that, we've got some uh, children's kids party for them and uh, the youth is also have have a night that night so it's on um, it's on the website if you want to check out everything there but I want to make sure you, that's this coming Wednesday all right I think that's all the pertinent stuff we gotta share so I think we're done smile let's stand word of prayer and then we'll close with the song Lord, I thank you that you break into our world with this message of your coming, of your loving, of your giving of yourself for us that provides hope and light, not just for today, but for you change eternity. Thank you that we not only receive that gift, but we get to share it. Equip us, Lord, please. Please be patient and don't grow tired of equipping, changing, transforming, so that we are we're carriers of this great gift. We're, we point back to you. Please, Lord, thank you for that opportunity, for, the, for your gift, yes, but also <laughs> this honor of being your fellow worker in our world today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.